so first of all, thank you for being on. Um, you know, um, it, yeah, and typically, like the the kind of audience that I service, which was why I was so interested in in having you on, is you know folks that like um, you know to make stuff and kind of you know my 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 interviews usually are, are tailored around the idea of the creative process and more importantly the process of actually having the discipline to do something right like my dad used to always tell me like um i just recently got my pilot's license and i was a little bit nervous about doing it to be perfectly frank with you right uh, and um he said 95% of it is just showing up you know um boy that's you know that's that's sound my father's advice to me was always make sure you're going to do something you love and it won't feel like work. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, Friedrich Nietzsche said something similar to that, right? Like work has to be entertainment. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. So, so look, first of all, I, I'm fascinated with your career because um, first of all, I'm also very, very familiar with it. I'm a, I'm a Star Trek, the next generation, you know, super fan. Um, like I said, I've gotten the privilege. What do you see season three of Picard, man? Yeah, I, I, I've I've been hearing that that's the season to end all seasons. Holy shit! I just I was uh, I watched the first four episodes on uh, what day is today? Wednesday, Tuesday, Wednesday, uh, Wednesday on Monday because I did Ready Room with Will Wheaton. I did two uh, episodes of the Ready Room. Yeah, yeah, yeah. I was just listening to it uh, to yeah. actually sort sort of warm myself up. And I uh, was talking about the uh, return the return of Riker and also directing a couple of the episodes. So they sent me four, the first four episodes of season three. It's like a fucking movie. It looks astounding. That's awesome. That's awesome. I, I have, I'm still working through the second season. Yeah. And that's work, man. <laughs> and that, that's the key <laughs> verb right there. Oh God. I think we um, stayed on earth a little too long. If you get my drift. Yeah. And, and um, how many of the of season three episodes are you directing? Two. Oh, okay, great, great. Yeah, I got a block each season, and they they're one of those shows where we do uh, a two episode block when they bring you in. So I did episodes uh, three and four on on Picard season three. And like currently, there's nobody in the current. I mean, aside from you and and folks from the cast, but none of that kind of old school. Brandon Braga. Did did you work on the um on the Brandon Braga show? God, I forget the name of it right now. It's the really Orville. Cool. Uh, yes, yes, the yeah. Orville. I did. I was hired on season one and two of the Orville, and then um, uh, what's his Seth MacFarlane and John Cassar took over, and they they co-direct all the episodes. They were doing it to adversity to to avoid the diversity mandate. <laughs> <laughs> but but you directed most of the first season, right? No, I directed in the first season. I directed the one with Charlize Theron. Oh, the okay, season. got it, got it. You watch Orville? I um, I saw season one uh, in preparation for my interview with Brandon. Um, he's a fascinating I, cat, isn't he? Oh, he's a great guy, man. Like he's like because he also kind of likes my kind of niche, which is that I also interview a lot of like astrophysicists on here and like quantum physicists and like. Brian Green and Neil deGrasse Tyson and those yeah. folks. Yeah. So, so I kind of dance because to me, physics is like such an incredibly imaginative kind of field, right? Like you need to have imagination to imagine what's possible without any instruments to actually test it, you know? And then you kind exactly. of. And that's why we have these, uh, these science, Dr. Erin uh, Anderson, who's, she works for our shows now. Mm -hmm. She's an astrophysicist and she came on because. All these writers want to make sure they get their shit right when they're creating these fictions. Yeah. So they want yeah. to get the science right. Yeah, which is a which is a huge part of it. And like you know, my journey into into being fascinated with quantum physics was actually directly born out of me watching the Next Generation. You know, so I I have in like a very holy place every single episode of TNG. For the day that you know, hopefully one day I have a child. I'm, I mean, I'm in my mid forties and I've already been through one divorce and still no kid, right? But you know, eventually I want to pass this on to somebody because it was such a perfect way to teach you, or even more importantly, get you interested in these crazy topics by just being so 
um, relating to the characters, right? Because you care so much about the characters. I know, that- and it's, one of the th- great things about doing the Star Trek conventions are all these, con- you know, all these hoary conventions that we show up at. Is that about fifty percent of the people who come up to your table to get your autograph or meet you at a, a um, photo opportunity? open with something like that. I became an astrophysicist because, or I became an astronaut because, or I became a doctor because, or I, you know, Mm. and they all reference how important the show was and how it presented something of interest to them that Mm. they ended up pursuing as their career. Or the other side is they say, the only time my father stopped hitting me was when we were watching, you know, it's it's got- Oh boy, yeah, yeah. Because- Curative powers as well. Yeah, and, and like I think it's all encompassing to the humanities as a whole, right? It's like when you took humanities in high school and they tried to teach you everything, right? There's like the arts and sculpture and theater and literature. Yeah. And it's like, you know, like the the kind of breath of morality that you also get out of Star Trek is is just so powerful. And to me, it really is that entire sort of TNG to enterprise uh, sort of timeline was uh is so holy in my mind because it's like you know the world was different like television production was different um you know like it's something that we might never see again right because even oh my god yes i mean that's when the wall came down and that's ironically that that was all the brannon years brannon was uh he he crossed that entire spectrum because he went all the way through to enterprise with us yeah. So so I'd like to maybe travel back in time a little bit uh, to when Jonathan Frakes was a young man, because to me, it's fascinating how, you know, no offense, you started out as the sort of handsome leading man and you've evolved your career into being the sort of intellectual creator behind the camera. And, and that's, you know, like any good character, that's quite the journey. And how how did it all kind of get started for you as a young man wanting to get into acting? Well, oddly, I went to Penn State. I wanted to be a uh, psychiatrist, I thought. Mm. So I went in as a as a psych major. And because I had not wanted, I wanted to take a year off. My father was an English professor. He thought it was a great idea to take a gap, what they now call a gap year. But my mother freaked out. He said, no, no, you've got to. So my dad used to teach at Penn State. Oh, and, wow. Uh, and he um, he went on to get his masters at university so you're not from alaska <laughs> you <Yanez>, alaska <laughs> anyway the, the short version of this story is i went in as a as i went against my better judgment and the only way that i could get into the main campus of penn state even with my dad pulling strings was to start in the summer which was a week after i graduated from high school so i was 17 mm. i went off to penn state wow and i uh which was great i mean i had a ball i didn't want to be there but i ended up having a ball and I, I went to the theater department to sign up to be an usher so I could see the plays for free, you know? Oh, wow. So I was signing on the board in the theater department, and the director, Richard Edelman, who became one of my mentors, comes down the hall. I said, hey, well, you're you're a tall guy. You look. How would you like to be in this play that we're doing? I said, are you kidding me? I said, I, he said all you got to do is you gotta sit on the ground. It was Arthur Coppett's play called Indians, and he mm. wrote that, and he wrote, oh, dad, poor dad, and interesting sort of 70s contemporary like a Sam Shepard kind of a playwright and it was a professional company called um what they called the New American Theater anyway at Penn State they brought these actors in from the city and from Actors Theater Louisville and from the Guthrie and from uh, the arena stage in Washington and you know they were loved they loved being in the mountains of Pennsylvania mm. so I went to rehearsal I said of course I would like to do this I went to rehearsal and I, I saw this lifestyle, because I'd done plays in high school, but I never thought of this as a career. So we rehearse at 10 in the morning, they read through the play, they stage it a little bit, then they break, get a little dinner, then they have a performance that night because it was a repertory company. So the play that was already up, they would go and do from you know 7.30 to 10, then at 10 o'clock they'd go to the bar, and then they'd go home and they'd go to sleep and they'd come back to the, I thought, what a fucking lifestyle this, this is awesome. <laughs> so I became a theater major, and um, wow. and it, and it, and it ended up working out. Most of the people at Penn State who were theater majors had families who said, "Dude, you got to get a real major and a real career because we're not putting you through college to do to be an actor." 
my dad, <laughs> my dad said, if you want to do this, go for it. He taught a film course, and among other things, that he was in the English department. And oh, that's awesome. So he was he was so encouraging, and I was so fortunate that it, that it just it worked out. So I graduated from Penn State with the most useless degree you could possibly get. I had a BFA in theater arts with a focus in acting. Now there's mm. a piece of paper that, <laughs> right. that you can really guarantee right. a fucking job with, right? It's almost like my degree. Yeah, from what NYU. I, from NYU, I got a degree in film and cinematography. Some two things that practically don't exist anymore. Yeah, no kidding. Film. Yeah. So I go to New York. I said, if I don't not working in five years, I'll go back and I'll do something else. So I moved furniture for a while. I was Captain America for a while, and then I got you know I started to get work, and I got on a soap, and I got into a, a replaced in the Broadway show, and. Everything started, then I got to work on some regional plays and they sent me to LA. Then I was the guest villain and the child beater and the bad boyfriend and the drug dealer and all these different shows. Mm -hmm. and, it just, and I always managed to have enough money to pay the rent and buy beer and pizza. And it was just, it just worked out until I got Star Trek. And then it changed my life. It was a, you know, it was pilot season. I auditioned seven times over six weeks to get the fucking part of Riker because there were so many people to audition sure. for. Because the, the the whole story with the reboot of Star Trek, Roddenberry, who was still with us at that time, mm. was so anti-network TV because I guess he had a bad experience with NBC when the show was on in the in the sixties. Mm -hmm. He refused to have it on a network, which is where they wanted to put it. So, as you may or may not remember, it was on weird channels like in Channel Thirteen in LA, and it was. Yeah, yeah, thirty three in Miami. It was always yeah. in syndication, right? It was always in. Here's the then. Here's the rub. It was in syndication, and it was the first scripted drama made directly for syndication. Right. So that provided two interesting um, challenges. For them, they only had to pay forty percent of SAG minimum, which was which sucked, mm -hmm. and it was sold independently to two hundred and thirty seven separate channels in the United States. Wow. So there were a whole bunch of people who were making decisions about who was going to be in the show. So I had to audition for people, all these different levels of. Oh, wow. Internet. I didn't realize that. Yeah. So that's why I went back seven times until whoever was the head of Paramount TV. And, you know, Gene was an advocate about after the second or third um, uh, audition. So I used to go to his office and, and uh, with Corey Allen, who directed the pilot and he would, he would, Gene would put me in kind of the zone, the Riker zone, and tell me about the 23rd century and stuff. It was fantastic. You know, he was, and, he was quite amazing. And like, for me, when I see Riker, especially in those early episodes, and I try to sort of imagine myself as a creative having to reboot this kind of iconic franchise that really at the time was underappreciated, right? Only three seasons, like not really like a monster hit. It was underappreciated, but the loyalty of the fan base was so incredible that they right. the only thing they wanted was another Star Trek with a bald English captain with a French name and a, and a Klingon on the bridge and an android running. You know, right? They didn't want any of that shit, and it was it was interesting how sort of hostile the uh, the audience was to us in the beginning, and the show wasn't great in the first couple of years anyway. Were Were you kind of like? Did anybody ever tell you, hey? Um, you know, you're basically like the the Kirk of this new uh, cast. You're the handsome, you know, maverick, you know, young gunslinger type. Like, were you kind of purposefully or like in the background, was that a note or a direction given to you? Like, you're basically no. serving that role? No, they, it was, it was implied. Oh, shit. Um. There no worries. You got to take that. I can pause. Let me let me tell him. I I said I said yes to noon, but I hey Larry. Six. Dude. Where? Larry. Delusion? Yeah, I was so wrong. I'm I'm in the middle of something at noon. I thought I forgot what time zone you were in. Can I call oh, you back? Oh, oh, sorry about that. I, I got a good uh, real estate question for you, but I'll, I'll call you back. Okay. All right. Any anytime. Right. I, I should be. Uh, I should be free. Okay. Bye. Bye. All right. Bye. No, no worries. You're on the East Coast. He's on the East Coast. I'm in LA. 
Oh, okay, okay, fair enough. So um, I, I, um, I wasn't told that, but it was very clear because I right. actually wasn't a Trekkie. I watched. Uh, my wife used to have a poster of Shatner on her wall when she was. <laughs> she, she knew all about Star Trek, but I rented uh, 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 VCRs to watch the original series. That's how I prepared for these final few auditions to get a, the vibe. I was right. I had my fucking head in the ground because I didn't know that it was part of the popular culture. I didn't know that my wife was Laura from Luke and Laura when I started to flirt with her on North and South. I I, I must have been I must have missed something in the eighties. Right, right, right. Well, you were probably so surprised that um, you guys managed to beat Vinny Testaverde and the Hurricanes in that national championship, being a Penn State guy. Oh my God. <laughs> you, were, were, were you in school during that? I was there and I was graduated in 74. Oh, wow. Okay. Okay. My bad. My bad. But you were already a fan. I mean, obviously you remember that, that, that game. I'll never forget that. You know, I was a little child, but, um, but anyway, not to get a uh, sidetracked on Penn state stuff because Penn state is just such an interesting place to talk about. I could probably do a whole podcast just on that, but. Oh God, the, I used to be so proud of Penn state. And then the, <laughs> and, uh, the, the Sandusky and Joe Paterno turning the other cheek stuff. It just, it ruined the reputation of that school in the way that um, the doctor ruined um, Michigan state. Yeah. Yeah. And the, uh, yeah, you know, when it rains, it pours. Michigan State's in some other fiasco right now as well. Ooh, whoa, that was loud. <laughs> oh, you still with me? I am. Okay, cool. All right, so anyway, going back uh, to those early days, you kind of um, had to, you get this amazing opportunity to do this reboot of this iconic um, show and you're just kind of starting to get your 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 sort of feet grounded in the character. How long? Because like I'm kind of a season one apologist because I think yeah. um, Encounter at Far Point is such a strong episode that it kind of sets the tone. I think for pretty much the entire show. And I love you know obviously the bookend with Encounter at Far Point and All Good Things is to me All Good Things is the greatest television finale uh in history um oh. and, and i'd put it up against you know um mash no i'd put it up against well mash yes i would put up against mash i would put up against breaking bad i would put it up against the sopranos i put up against everything um you guys won a hugo award for it it's one of the most interesting stories i think ever told in television because it really makes you think differently and when Q tells Picard, when you realize the paradox is when you started putting all the things together, that's like a thus spoke Zarathustra moment. I mean, and yeah. it's not a very easy thing to capture in any kind of medium. Exactly. You know? And a lot of that credit goes to uh, Delancey. I mean, Q is an amazing character, but what Delancey brought to the party and continues to, because he's in sure. uh, he's in Picard as well. Yeah. I had a, I had a, a day with Delancey and Brent in season two of Picard that was so spectacular and so absurd where, <laughs> and uh, Brent's playing uh, Sung and they're, they're in a, like a diner and Q and Sung. It was, it was anyway, we digress yet again. But then, yeah, yeah. You would think that Riker looked like he had a stick up his ass for the whole first couple of, I was so physically uncomfortable because Roddenberry has said to me, what I want from you, Frakes, is don't laugh. Don't smile. I want a Midwestern Gary Cooper glint in your eyes. <laughs> that, was, that, was his, uh, that was his direction. So I'm so um, rambunctious and kind of, uh, you know, I run, I run, I run busy and hot. You know what I mean? Right, right. And he wanted me to be, I guess, stoic, more stoic than I, I was used to. I thought Patrick was covering the stoic part of the fucking. Uh, <laughs> you know? so yeah, to me, Rodberry finally said to me when we came back after season one, after these writer strikes, you know what? Let's let a little more freaks into Riker. And I said, thank God. Well, first of all, thank God because that's that's exactly what made Riker Riker, and he stopped being Midwest and started becoming Alaska. Because <laughs> to me, to me, the whole yeah, sure, he was born on the moon. And like, I can't believe I know all this stuff, but I really am a fan of the show. But he, he he was born on the moon, but his family's Alaskan. And you really get that vibe 
that this guy is a wilderness, like, like, like salt of the earth. Like, you know, he's an alpha male, you know, he's an alpha male, but, but he's got like a code of ethics and like, like, that was um, his, I thought that was his strongest characteristic. I did an interview yesterday and they said, well, how do you, what's the most important quality that uh, Riker had? And I said, loyalty, you know, yeah. he was so loyal to Picard and so trustworthy and honest. And I mean, I aspire to be as fucking good a man as, as Riker is also what they buried in that first season, which I thought was a mistake was that mm. uh, not only were Troy and Riker, in love and lovers, mm. but um, Riker could, he had picked up some of her empathic ability. I think it was in the pilot that I could feel. Right, 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 right. He was thinking. And that shit, that would have been great. So Marina and I refused to let that that um, subtext die. So we played the entire seven seasons still in love in spite of all the aliens that she went off to bed with and, <laughs> and all that other shit. Right. And all the people that Riker took to bed but it was, uh, and then finally in Nemesis, they finally realized, oh, these two can get married because you feel like they're in love. I thought, yeah, no shit, we're in love. We've been, you guys tried to kill it and we kept it alive. <laughs> yeah. You know, uh, speaking of Riker's loyalty, because it's one of my favorite episodes. I mean, look, there's so many great episodes, but you just made me think about one episode where that loyalty comes into um, not question, but that, that, that loyalty's tested. I think to like the most maximum degree in the series is that one episode where the guy who plays John Locke in Lost. Uh, oh, God, I, yeah. Oh, that God, I forget his name right now. This is a callback for the end of, uh, for the end of Enterprise. I don't remember the name of the episode either, but it was about lying. It was Riker lying for his superior officer. Was it right, not? right. Yeah, yeah, exactly. So he has this conflict is my loyalty with, the you know it's almost like this interesting precession of the simulacrum like is my loyalty with my past the simulacrum it... what is that so the simulacrum is basically comes from a, a plato's um um like allegory of the cave where there's people that are sitting in a cave and they're looking at shadows on a wall being reflected by the fire and the shadows on the wall coming from the fire are actually being created by a city that's off in the distance but these people relate to the shadows on the wall more than they relate to the actual city that's creating them so for example like um people that um you know say um you know use a tissue paper and they call it kleenex but it's not really kleenex it's just a random tissue paper right like that you start to relate to the simulation or the recreation of something more than you do the original. I got it. So, so like Great in this, work. so in this context, you have your old captain who's kind of reminding you, hey, Riker, you're you were always the most loyal one. Yeah. And then your current captain saying, but your responsibility is to the safety of this ship. Like, where does it really lie? And anyway, that was just a great episode, you know. Um, uh, it's like you know, I mean, there's so many great Riker episodes. One of my other random favorite ones, just to like riff for one second, is is the one where um, you um, you kind of wake up and um, you know you're all of a sudden you're the captain and you have a kid that you named Picard or Jean Luc, and like you know um, this kid is like playing this whole mind game on you. I mean, I don't know, man. You have countless amounts of great episodes. You know that must have been a blast to like work on that show. It was great. It was great to have that many. Uh characters because you could carry an episode you'd have an episode like that or, or um skin of evil or, or, or I'm, I'm thinking about the one frame yeah, of mind the one where i went crazy where, where you'd, you'd be carrying the show and then the next oh, episode, that's a great one the one where you're doing a theater play oh right my god that was a, that was a wonderful show. i think that might have been brandon anyway the um then you have the next week you have like four lines in the bridge and you have four days off it was it was great <laughs> right, right. So, so how long did you, did it take for you to feel like you found Riker? About season three, I felt like I was, uh, I was in a zone that that felt good to me. I think, I think part of it was finding Riker, and also the uh, seven, eight of us finding each other, and and the mm. and the, uh, the relationship, wow, that... Riker's relationship to Troy was pretty clear. 
Riker and Picard developed into one of the, you know, really strong buddy brother stories that continues all through, as you'll see oh. in Picard season three. That was important. Riker and Worf had a special relationship. Uh, Geordi and Data had a huge relationship. Obviously, Crusher and, and Picard had, a, you know, there were there were twos and threes that were quite successful and they um as they were as they were nurtured and they grew they became denser and more interesting yeah because like you know it's funny when you say that like my mind kind of like like started spinning because your character talking about simulacrum your character you know he's commander riker but a lot of people refer to him as number one right so it's like yes. like like it speaks to that point of that intimacy between you and and Picard, where you became known by a nickname, you know. Yes, because, but exactly. everybody, you know, this is like my number one guy. You know, this is like the guy I trust the most. It's just that was Roddenberry. That was number one. Was I guess some uh, hornblower shit? You know, that was the first. <laughs> that's what they called the first officer was number one. Yeah, yeah, no, that's great. So, so when when did you get? Um, or maybe a, like a better way to ask this is when did you start kind of sniffing around saying, Hey, I want to, I want to go behind that camera. Yeah. I think I can take a shot at directing one of these. I started in the first season. I, it became very clear to me that there was so much sitting around, as you know, making a TV show and you can only take so many naps and there's it's Mitchum or somebody has the great quote that, uh, I act for free. They pay me to wait. <laughs> <laughs> right, right, right. That's a good one. And, uh, and you know, I'm, I, I don't wait well. I don't wait in line well. So let alone, <laughs> so I, I spent a lot of time in the set when most people, you know, would go back to their dressing rooms and hang and do whatever. And it was clear that the center of the set was over there by the, by the director. I mean, it's not necessarily the director's set, as I've learned when it, since becoming a director. It's really depending on the show. It's either the um, the star, often the number one, or the uh, cinematographer, or the first AD. Somebody, it's someone else's set that you're a guest on. But I was um, interested, and I expressed it to Rick Berman, who was kind of the keeper of all things Star Trek. Yep. And he said, "Well, you know, you can shadow these guys." We'll talk to the directors and they were all very, very generous with their time. And I stole a lot of good ideas from them. And I realized that I, I knew something about staging and I certainly had, I was such a fan of television and film. I knew a little bit about the camera. I didn't know anything about editing. So he said, I got to get you in the editing room. And ironically, or not ironically, not surprisingly, the editors of course wanted to be directors as well. So mm. four or five of these guys were, um, generous with their time reluctantly and I could feel it, but they let me in their room and I watched them cut episodes that I had just watched them sh other people shoot and learning, especially on a TV we, we used to make a show in seven days for a million six. And now it's, you know, 14 days for $10 million to do a fucking episode of Star Trek. So it's right, a right, right. And a million six is a big budget back in the day. Is it really? The part of that deal I was telling you about before with the 237 channels, it was a million six, but half of the uh, half of the advertising was already sold with right. the show. Right. So a million six, they had already had six or seven million dollars of commitment made. Wow. Yeah. And they also had, we had three contracts. We had a contract for the pilot. Then we had a contract, if the pilot did well, to extend to, to shoot the first 13. And then if that did well, they had a contract that became a you know a four year or five year uh, commitment if the show stayed mm -hmm. on. But they they hedged their bets so brilliantly on that show. Yeah, yeah. So 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 okay. So you're talking to the editors. Oh, I'm talking to the editors, and then that then I got an idea of what the minimum you needed was. That was really what I learned. I mean, I I learned mm -hmm. what you needed to cover a scene, and uh, I, I especially as simplistic as next gen was and rick was very could, traditional could you, he didn't like to cut out of moving shots to moving shots could you could you go into that a little bit because i think that's something that people you know have heard that word and maybe don't know exactly what it means but what do you mean when you say cover a scene oh, yeah. Because yeah i think that's the most important part of being a tv director you've got to get your coverage and i in my world and and i think most directors and most television you got to get 
uh, geography shot, what spelling would call would be the uh, where the fuck are we shot. <laughs> mm. And and you don't have to use it at the beginning of the scene, but you want to know either what room, what place, what building, what part of the city, where you, you want to get your widest version of where the scene takes place. Then you have to decide on whose point of view the scene is being told through so that you're pivoting on, and generally it was Picard, if he was in a scene, we were reporting to him or he was the, mm. so you would stage it in a way that his coverage would, we used to line people up and we'd do it so fast. We'd, you don't, you never want to shoot in four different directions if you can help it. So mm. I, you take as much as you take the, um, half of the, half of the set for the cameras and the opposite half of the set for the actors and the story in a perfect world. And occasionally you have to turn all the way around, but you never want to cover like a poker game. You never want to be able, you never want to have to move the camera to five different spots to cover everybody or you get your, you just still have time. Interesting. You learn tricks about who's in what position over what shoulder that look would be. So you'd blind person up. You say, ah, that we can cheat that. We'll keep that over the right shoulder. Yeah. If you look over here, that works to right shoulder, right shoulder, right shoulder, right shoulder. Then maybe you reverse on somebody else. It's really you guys, high lines. And you guys were a single camera shoot back in the early days, or you had multiple? In the early days, on? it was a single show. Um, I'm trying to remember if we always had two cameras or not. We almost never had three. Because you guys were shooting, you guys were shooting 35 millimeter film, right? Yeah, we were at old the old Panasonic cameras, 35 mil, and it was four by three in the beginning. It wasn't even uh, sure, sure, yeah, yeah. It was, and we go. Which is the lot. reason why the um, the uh, re, like the remastered TNGs look spectacular. I don't know if you've seen them. I'm sure you have. Oh, the, the Blu-rays, you mean? Yeah, they look amazing, like yeah. absolutely amazing. Because it was film, but it yeah. was very. I mean. The, the scripts were great and the acting was great and the stories were great, but it was not exciting cinematically, I would say. Is that fair? <laughs> that look, that is fair because, but it was it wasn't exciting cinematically, but it was consistent with the language of television, right? The yeah. lexicon presented on a four by three screen in your living room. Yes. and and you had different responsibilities as a visual storyteller back then than you do now. Because the medium and the format has changed, right? So yeah, and also, also the audience, the, the uh, audiences can handle so much more information because they've, you know, especially young audiences, they because they're gamers and they multitask and and they they get bored if the camera doesn't move, you know. Right, right, and, and like so, uh, you know, I'm kind of bearing the lead here, but the 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 first episode that you directed oh. uh, is very interesting because. It, that same storyline, it seems like you're still talking about to this day in your current stuff that you're directing with Picard, um, which is, you know, The Offspring, which is what I think one of the best uh, episodes of Star Trek ever, to be honest with you. Um, Ooh, such a blessing and such a mitzvah to have that episode as my first episode. So that's three years in. So, right. So let me finish off the prep shit. I, yeah, I yeah, 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 yeah. And then Rick included me in pre-production. Then they included me in casting. Then include me in, in concept meetings and uh, spotting where you decide where the where the sound is going to go and where the music is going to go. And then my favorite part always was going to the scoring sessions because we actually used a real orchestra still. And Dennis McCarthy, who was our composer. So there were a lot of people who were really welcoming to me, who really made a difference to me. And by the time I got Offspring, I was so over-prepared, if you That's will. That's awesome. And I had... I was so excited. My wife, to, to her credit, I remember we lived out here in her house in uh, Woodland Hills. And I said, you know what? I, I'm not shooting today, but I'm, I'm not going to go in. She said, that's what they're waiting for. Rick is waiting for you to lose interest and not go in on a day that you're not shooting. And right. I was so fucking right. So I, 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 it made it clear that I was interested enough to be there all the time. Wow! And frankly, it just made me a it made me a better director to have spent that much time watching other people do it. Were you the first one from the core cast that got yeah. to direct? Yeah, I, I I went in, and then a lot of the other ones: Gates directed, and Patrick directed, and Lavar directed, uh, Dorn directed. Lavar really 
is a wonderful director. Patrick didn't like it as much. Gates wasn't given a, a great script. Dorney, I'm not sure if he loved it or not, but uh, Lavar continues. Lavar's got, got a uh, he's a regular on the which one now? He used to do NCIS New Orleans. It's NCIS Hawaii. Yeah, yeah. He also did a bunch of episodes of Voyager. Um, yeah. One actually very good one where they're like stuck in the snow. Um, yeah, yeah. He he also has that you know has that you know that like my grandfather used to say, you know, la peste in Spanish it means like the smell. Yeah, like I like 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 I don't know if it translates well, but like some people just have that intonation to be able to like do it, and it seems like he's definitely got it. He does it because he's like me too. He likes both sides of the camera. He's a schmoozer, and um, it, uh, I like the crew and the cast. Mm. Patrick was, I think Patrick was, he's such an artist as an actor. I'm not sure because I'm like a grip. I like, you know, I'm <laughs> right, right. I you're from Alaska. You're from Alaska. You know, you're like a bush pilot. Exactly. I identify <laughs> as a grip. <laughs> anyway, that's the short version or the long version. And when Offspring came around, it was a data story, as you know. Yeah. Brent was arguably the most interesting, or, or data was the most interesting character in the show. Certainly my favorite character in the show. It was written by uh, Renea Chavaria. It was a, a spec script that he had submitted to uh, Michael Piller. And he was a, right, a fellow Cuban, one one of my one of my people. One of your people, right? Yeah. And yeah. then he went on to become a regular on that show, executive producer on Deep Throat Nine. And then he ran Castle. I mean, his that show started his career like that show started my career. Yeah. Yeah. I I also uh, worked a little bit um, with Manny Cotto because I used to work on the show Dexter. Oh. And and Manny he just also the new Dexter on TV on the plane. I um, liked it. I did I, too. I didn't work on that one, just to be perfectly transparent. Uh, you know, I'm like in the earlier uh, Dexter uh -huh. timeline. And um, yeah, it's a fascinating show, but there's actually a few Star Trek kind of crossovers with that show. I mean, not to mention it's also CBS Showtime and all that kind of stuff. But but, but, but in any case, the what, what I really want to ask you is when you saw that script, because that script, looking back at it now, especially with everything that's going on now and even in the video game that I'm working on that has so much advanced AI in it. Mm -hmm. um, and here's a show about an AI, right? Like, you know, the, uh, the, the, you know, the Pinocchio story that data was finally evolving or yeah. actually not, not really because measure of a man, I think is before offspring. And that was obviously yeah. an incredible episode, but this is like the next step, right? Like, what is what is what is the answer to life? The answer to life is to create more life, and um, here's Data's chance to do that. And what a script! I mean, like like how did you feel when you got that script and actually read it the first time? It was such a mitzvah because he, I knew it was Data, and I then I uh, Hallie Todd was perfect, and then there's a little Crowfoot who played the little mini Data. Whoopi was in it, which also helped matters, so it had some levity. Bob Foxworth was in it. It was a um, it were, and I had, I actually shot a lot of wide shots in that show that I I noticed, looking back that that they stayed in, which was very rare. There was it was such a rare thing to shoot wide on on Star Trek. Everybody was into close up, close up, close up, close up. So I was um, I was psyched, and Brent was psyched, and I had there was really good energy. The the sound department, the Bernard family gave me a megaphone, you know. Oh, nice. Find a good luck megaphone to start. It was just the whole vibe was uh was spectacular but again it was the luck of the fucking draw because i could have had a really shitty episode and that would have been the end of it because what you, you really can't shine shit no matter how good you are if you got a shitty episode and it doesn't go well and it turns out to be eh, like some of them are they're not all home runs i don't sure. think i would have had the uh success that i was able to have by moving from that to then to brandon again cause and effect yeah, and, cause and effect's such a good one too. Yeah. I mean, I, I I love those kind of like time loop type episodes. But here, here, let me ask you a question because I always ask this to every director that I have on the show, um, and and like I always say this little story when I used to play baseball in high school, um, my coach one time told me something I'll never forget. He walked up to me at like at the plate, and he said, "Marks, you know, Marco, you know, my name is Spanish." He's like, "Sometimes there's players that you got to be an asshole to, and there's players that you got to coddle up." And then there's players that you can just tell the truth to. 
So I'm going to tell you the truth. If you don't get this guy out of here, I'm going to have to pull you. And I, I was able to get the guy out of there. So it's basically that approach of knowing how to deal with an actor yep. and an actor's ego to get what you want. What's your approach? Well, they're all different. Mm. I don't have one approach, but I do appreciate the shorthand I have with people like Patrick and Brent. Where it, I mentioned earlier this the day I had with um, Delancey and Brent on, on Picard season two, I thought I was in prep and I thought, oh, look at this schedule. Here's a day where I have those, the two of them, and a couple of guest stars and me all day. I thought, oh, it's going to be, there's no drama. There's going to be no bullshit. It's going to be fucking filled with laughs. <laughs> they're all going to bring, they're all going to bring these fabulous ideas. It's, it's, you know, and then there are days on other shows, not so much on Star Trek. I've worked on shows where the, uh, some of the actors were so nasty, not to me generally, but to other people. Right. It just made your fucking skin boil. And you thought, oh, fuck. Another because man, with that, like, you you've directed at this point like over a hundred episodes of television. Is is that fair to say? It is, like, and I'm so glad to be at that number because I remember one of my mentors on the when I was shadowing was a guy named Cliff Ball who used to work for all the spelling shows, and of he had course. hundreds of credits, and he he worked so efficiently and sneakily good. I always thought, but I thought, God. Wouldn't it be great to have a hundred episodes? And now I'm there, and I feel like this feels great. I'm, I'm, it, your confidence is boosted. Your, you, you feel um, that you can make. I always, my objective always is to make the best version of this show that I can make. I always approach it that way. You never want to admit that your shit, your script is shitty, but even when you know it is, you never want to. You know, you never want to see them. You never want to show yourself crying. What did they say? You never really want to do something. It's yeah. Yogurt. You don't. They can't. Don't let them see you crying or whatever the fuck it is. Right. If you have a shitty script, you shine that fucker up as hard as you can, and you um, encourage people to 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 bring it because it's. We did twenty six a year, man. I know. I know. And was, you know, it's crazy. Twenty six a year, and I'm still watching them. You know, like all these years later, it's like. There's something about watching a Star Trek episode that's like hanging out with like a friend or, you know, you know, for me, I almost used to look forward to getting sick because I knew if I was sick, I'm going to binge Star Trek all day. So you were that heavy a Trekker? Oh man, uh, absolutely. Big time, big time. And it was T and so I told Brandon the story, but one time Brandon went to NYU and um, he was giving a course or, or like one of these guest speakers on like of, of, of screenwriting. And the course was write us a spec uh, Star Trek script. And oh. I had I had never really like I mean, I knew about it, but I was lost in Michelangelo and Tony Oni and Igmar Bergman. And, like uh-huh. you know, I was convinced I was the next, you know, Francois Truffaut. Um, but then. I was like, okay, I want to do good in this course because I want to, you know, you, you, you got to take pride in your work. So I started watching. Um, I walked over to Tower Records and I bought Encounter at Farpoint um, and a few other like, you know, a, a, a VHS as they had on sale. And I was so friggin' hooked from that point on that I probably spent half my money on just buying everything. No uh, shit. Yeah, man. Like, it, like I got into Star Trek when I was at NYU studying film. Like that's, that's wild because I because you are you you're deep. You have a good knowledge of the of the whole world. And you mentioned something. You just touched on something. I have to start something else at ten. So we got about ten more minutes. I right, no worries, no worries. This has been a pleasure. I had I had uh, nobody addressed the fact that Data, who's now Sung, is building a fucking daughter. On start on Picard season two, right, right. No, no, that's my point. It's like no, that's what I'm saying. We we scooted right over that. And I, <laughs> are you are anybody going to talk about lore? Are we going to mention the fact that you know, <laughs> right, it was right. as if it didn't? Isn't it feel? I mean, have you seen those episodes? Um. Okay. Look, I'm going to be totally forthcoming with you. I am such a Star Trek kind of like purist in a way that I've struggled a little bit with Picard. But after this conversation, I'm going to give it a different eyes just because now I feel closer to you. And I'm going to, so, so now I'm going to, you know, I'm going to give it a different vibe. 
But like I mean, it's it's I mean season three is a must, but season two part of season two is a struggle because the idea of being on Earth is it's wonderful and I'm, and it calls back to the whale at movies which were great. But we were in the middle of COVID and they didn't know that when we started. Right, so, right. So they couldn't shoot with thousands of people and shoot LA and and shoot the excitement of being on Earth with a bunch of people from a different century. And we stayed too long at the fucking fair, man. It's uh, right, right, right. You know, I struggled. I'll be honest with you. Can I be straightforward with you on please. this one? I struggled with how Picard was being treated in the first few episodes that I saw in Picard. It was um, so slow and pedantic, and 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 they were screaming at him, and everybody's insulting him, and yeah. like this is this is Jean Luc Picard. <laughs> you know, this guy is like. A, a like a like a mountain of intellect and like understanding of the human condition, like it didn't feel like like I felt like Picard was being insulted for no reason at times. So yeah, but I, he, I think wasn't that be? I wonder if that wasn't by choice because Patrick's whole thing about doing Picard was that it is the man thirty years later. He's no longer in Starfleet. He's examining his past. He's. uh comfortably or uncomfortably on this vineyard <laughs> right which, which is a great throwback to that amazing episode of him oh, and his brother him and his brother exactly yeah so it was um it was by design i think and then when he tried to get back to starfleet the, the admirals yelled at him and all that i i get that but i think they were uh, i think they cre and also pa patrick insisted on losing weight so he'd look more vulnerable there was a whole he, it right. was it was built in a way intentionally but I'll, you're not the first to express what you just expressed, which is we think of Picard as a, you know, he's a fucking legend. Right, right. He's a right. legend in Starfleet. He's a legend in the universe. I mean, Picard is a fucking legend. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. So look, well, I have three minutes with you left, man, because I have to bring this up. I just had Nicholas Meyer oh. and, um, you know, Nicholas is great. And he's also has like a theater background. And he did Undiscovered Country, which is one of my favorite Star Trek movies. But I think the best Star Trek movie is First Contact. So just give me a little nugget of how you ended up directing that movie. Because that movie, I think, is what, like, I don't know. I haven't fully grasped how important that movie is. But it's incredibly important to the franchise, if not the most important one. I, um, um, I love hearing you say that because most people put Wrath of Khan first. I think Wrath of Khan's great, but First Contact, first of all, was bulletproof because of Ron yeah. and Brandon's script. It was fucking bulletproof. Yeah. In terms of story, it had it was like a horror movie. It had levity. And then we were lucky enough to get my godmother, Alfre Woodard, to play Lily, who was genius in it. Um, she was great in it. Absolutely great in it. And Zaf, Z um, what's his name, who played Zephyrin Cochran, who was a oh my god, you know, we, me and my friends, James, James, me and my, well, and he was just coming off Babe, right? Yeah, me, me and my friends use that line all the time. I love a good peep show, like, like, like whenever I say, "Hey, come check this out," <laughs> we always say that I love a good peep show because I don't know if you remember when they, when like you know they ask him to look at through the telescope. Oh so they, God, he was astounding, <laughs> and, and also Alice, Alice Krieger was sexy and smart and terrifying as the queen. So we had yeah. three great guest stars. We had a bulletproof script. Um, I got the job because it was Star Trek Eight, and there were no A-list uh, action sci-fi directors. Certainly Ridley Scott wasn't going to do it. Spielberg wasn't going to do it. Ken, uh, Ken Zemeckis wasn't going to do it. There was, you know, all the people that you would think of who would get one of those movies, they're not going to come and do Star Trek Eight. So then we're back to other movie directors and and sherry lansing who ran paramount at the time mm. at least this is how the legend goes I, I wasn't in this conversation sherry says to rick berman who was as i said the keeper of all things star trek and yep whose wife is the godmother of my son and oh wow that's cool yeah, who uh said rick i love star trek and i love that it's part of paramount but i do not understand it you you pick you pick the director Oh, wow. And, and they have, um, and Patrick would have uh, approval because Patrick by this point was, you know, clearly the, uh, the franchise. Sure. So 
I threw my hat in the ring, obviously. Everybody else did. I guess they interviewed a bunch of people. And at some point, because I was continuing to do episodes that were doing well and everything, you know, I, I was consistent, I think. I got this shit done on time. The cast trusted me. Rick trusted me. And for some reason, I was it, it worked out. So that, in a way, was a big blessing, just like getting Offspring was as a mm. uh, as an episode. Amazing. I mean, and that was the it was the beginning and the pinnacle of my movie directing career because then Insurrection was not as good. Then Clockstoppers was good, but still a different genre. And then I went to Movie Jail after Thunderbirds because it was a, a major disaster. And now right. I'm gratefully back in in television. So First Contact not only was a wonderful movie, but it was it was a uh, what an experience for a first movie to have a script that good and to have and I had Matt Leonetti who was like a big brother to me who taught me that you know when you're shooting a movie you don't have to sh worry about how making things small and making you know we we would do four pages instead of eight pages in a day there was a whole learning curve for me. Oh man, and just like even like the cinematography and the way like that one scene where where you come in. Oh God, I'm getting chills just thinking about it. Cause like I remember writing my stuff in school and hearing you say this in my head because I'm a big fan of uh of Berlioz and you walk into the ready room and yes. um, yeah, and he's listening to it. Oh my god. Yeah, yeah, and it's all dark and moody, oh. and like it, it's Dr. Faustus. He's listening to uh you know to Faust, and you walk so in, good. yeah, it's just beautiful stuff, man. But look, I want to be sensitive to your time. You've been so generous with me. Um, I know that you have uh, another appointment. Hopefully one day I can chat with you again, Jonathan. This was really illuminating for me. I would be happy to. You are a wonderful interviewer. You're clear. You're smart. You're funny. I would. Uh, I really enjoyed this. I've done a lot of these, as you can well imagine. And you are, <laughs> you are you're, you're a delight. How did this come to pass? So, so I um I used to own a company called Collider. Maybe you're familiar with it. Of course, yeah. Uh, so I used to own that, and then I sold it um, around uh, 2020 uh, when because we were blowing up. And my passion is to make video games. That's where I come from. I come from the video game industry. Uh -huh. So I kind of reverted back to my passion. But when I was at Collider, I, I developed quite you know um, a solid uh, podcasting audience. And I don't do them as much as I used to anymore. But I, but like when somebody says, Hey, there's an opportunity to talk to Brandon or Tim Russ or Jonathan Frakes or Nicholas Meyer or like some of my heroes, I always still do it. Awesome. Um, you do a great but, job, man. Yeah, man. This was, this was amazing, Jonathan. I wish you nothing but the best. Um, your face will never see YouTube. You have my word on that. You're a deer. Enjoy season three, man. And happy holidays. Okay. Happy holidays. Bye bye, sir. Thank you, brother. Bye bye.